Hey, welcome back. It's Mrs. Mays, and we're looking at wave particle duality of both light and matter. In our last podcast, we looked at the duality of light. Now we're going to look at matter. In the last video, I introduced the idea that really small things act sometimes like waves and sometimes like particles. So, how can we actually picture this wave particle duality of, say, an electron? Well, Imagine our electron is a speck of dust in a raindrop. We know pretty well where the speck is, at first. But when the drop hits the ground, it'll spread out like a wave. And the speck of dust will be somewhere in that wave. So the speck, our electron, is guided by the wave. But there's still only one speck, and if you actually look for it, you'll only find it in one place. The wave will also tell you how likely you are to find the speck at any one point. If the drop splits in two, you're more likely to find the speck wherever there's more water. And that's pretty much how the wave-particle duality of quantum mechanics works. Each particle is guided by a wave, called a wave function or pilot wave, that determines the chances it'll be in a certain place or state. Easy, right? The hard part is figuring out the movement of the waves. So now we're going to talk about how can matter actually act like a wave. Well, first of all, let's consider the momentum of a photon. A photon must travel at the speed of light because it's a particle of light. So it's going to go uh, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. When it's going that fast, special relativity tells us two things. First of all, the mass of the photon when it's going that fast is exactly zero. So it has no measurable mass. And the momentum of the photon depends on only its wavelength because its mass is zero. So those are the things that we know about the photon um, when it's going the speed of light, which it must do because it's a particle of light. So what this means for us then, if the mass is equal to zero, then that means its entire momentum, P, is coming from its wavelength. And it's like this, Planck's constant times its frequency. Let me write this. Planck's constant times its frequency divided by the speed of light. And since we know that the speed of light is equal to uh, the wavelength times the frequency, then I can do some substitution. So let's re rearrange this. In the place of the speed of light, I'm going to put the wavelength and the frequency. So P is equal to H nu divided by C is lambda nu. Notice, now I have frequency on the top and on the bottom, so that goes away. So the momentum is only equal to the um, Planck's constant divided by the wavelength. Momentum depends only on the wavelength. And this equation, that P equals, oops, that momentum is equal to Planck's constant divided by the wavelength turns out to be really, really important. See? Check it out. There was a guy in 1920, uh, 1924, his name is Louis de Broglie, and he asked, well, if light can behave like a wave, then if light can behave like a wave or a particle, then could matter, which normally behaves like particles, also behave like a wave? And what he found out is it really does behave like a wave sometimes. Isn't this crazy? Well, actually, it always behaves like a wave, just sometimes the wavelength is so small we can't really see it. So here was the first expression for momentum. Momentum is equal to Planck's constant divided by the wavelength. We just showed that. But we also know from classical physics that momentum is equal to mass times velocity, where this V is not the same as nu. This is velocity, and then nu is uh, frequency. So we have to be careful not to confuse our two things that look a lot like Vs. Yeah, I'll be very um, careful with that and always 
if you're if you have a question and you're not sure which one I mean be sure to ask so this wavelength Okay, so when de Broglie combined these two equations, what he found is that the wavelength of any object, any particle of matter, can be related to Planck's constant divided by its mass times velocity, its momentum, essentially, because they're the same. These two both measure momentum, so he put the equations together. The wavelength is really small for most normal objects, so it had never even been noticed before, because you can't measure a wavelength that is uh, too small for us to detect. But it has a very dramatic impact on the structure of the atom, because an atom is also really small. Electron wavelengths, you see, are generally in the size range of 10 to the minus 10 meters, which is about the same as the size of an atom. So the wave character of electrons is super important. Imagine if um, a baseball in the Major League Baseball was as important as the electron wavelengths are in atoms. So if this wave was bigger, then as the pitch was coming at the batter, it would have a wavelength and then the batter would have a wavelength, and the bat itself would have a wavelength, and when you hit the ball, it would wave around while you're trying to catch it. Boy, that could really complicate the game of baseball, couldn't it? So let's see, would this wavelength really be important? So if we have a 0.3 kilogram ball traveling at 20 meters per second, what would its wavelength be? Let's use de Broglie's equation. Wavelength is equal to Planck's constant, divided by momentum, mass times velocity, and let's calculate the wavelength. So first of all, we know Planck's constant is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. And we also know the mass of our ball is 0 0.33 kilograms. And we know too that our velocity is 20 meters per second. So now let's solve this. Um, the wavelength is going to be equal to Planck's constant divided by momentum. So I substitute these values into the equation and then we're going to get our calculator and work it out. Oh, but you know what I want to have? Yeah, we're going to have to talk about units. Okay. Here's our equation, but let's look at these units. I have joules times seconds on the top, kilograms on the bottom, and meters per second on the bottom. Meters per second, if you have a fraction in the denominator, then that um, seconds has to move back up. So I have joules times seconds times seconds, so seconds squared, over kilograms. Let me remind you that a joule simply means for every one kilogram, you have an acceleration of meters per second squared. So one joule is equal to one kilogram times one meter per second squared. So I'm going to put that unit in the place of joules. And let's see what happens to the rest. Kilogram on top, meters on top, and then second squared on the bottom, second squared goes away, kilograms goes away, and I'm left with meters, which makes sense because I'm looking for the wavelength. So meters makes perfect sense. Now let's get our calculator out. Um, use the E button for your scientific notation, and we get a value of... Ah, here it is. We don't need all the decimals, just three sig figs ought to do. 1.00 times 10 to the negative 34 meters. That's the wavelength of a ball that is 0.33 kilograms in its mass going 20 meters per second. That wavelength 
is so small that we're not going to even be able to measure that. It's too tiny. Negative 34, that's smaller than what we can even measure. So that's why uh, baseball in Major League Baseball doesn't wave around. It has a wavelength, but the wavelength is so small you can't even see it. Let's try another example. Let's, let's use a particle that's smaller, say an electron. So an electron that's moving with a speed that is 80% the speed of light would have what wavelength? Let's see now if this wavelength is any more uh, critical, something larger that we can measure. So we know H is still Planck's constant, joules times seconds are the units there. Remember what joules are, kilogram times meter per second squared. And then mass of an electron is 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. And the velocity of our electron is approaching the speed of light. It's 2.4 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. So I'm going to substitute my values into the formula so we can solve for wavelength. So Planck's constant goes on top. Joules times seconds are the units. We're going to divide by the product of mass times velocity. 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31. Be very careful in the way you put these numbers into your calculator because order of operations is really important. You want to make sure you're dividing by the product of mass times velocity and not um, just dividing by the mass and then multiplying the whole answer by velocity. That won't get you the right answer that you're looking for. So our wavelength turns out to be, let's see, crank it through the calculator, uh, 3.04 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. Boy, that's still a really small wavelength, but guess what? This is the wavelength that we observe in things like x-rays or gamma rays. This is about that same uh, wavelength. So this is a wavelength that we actually can detect and measure. That means the wavelength of electrons is more important than the wavelength of larger things, things that are bigger than atoms, like um, say you and me and, and baseballs and all sorts of other things. So the wave nature of matter was proposed by de Broglie. And then it was finally proven experimentally when electrons are fired one at a time towards two slits, like the double slit experiment. Then we would expect the electrons to just pass through one slit or the other. But actually, they show the same interference pattern as light does. So when we, when we fire them at the slits, we expect to see just a dot on the wall behind there. But what happens is we see a wave. So the electron wave has to go through actually both of the slits at the same time. And we can't imagine a single particle actually doing this, but it does. Let me show you. And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now 
there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good, so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter, through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So, they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently. As though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. So as strange as it may seem, nature has a wave-particle duality both in light and as electrons. So if you only look at one electron at a time, then it's going to look like a particle. But many electrons, taken all together, begin to look like waves. So in this picture, you see the, the firing of one electron at a time through the double slits. And as time goes by, we get this interference pattern the same as what we saw for light, because we are looking at not just one electron at a time, but all the electrons taken together. Individual electrons must behave like a wave and pass through both slits. But then each electron must also be a particle when it strikes the film, or it wouldn't make a dot. It would sort of like be spread out, right? So what we see is that 
matter acts like both a wave and a particle. And this is going to have a profound impact on the way we view atomic structure and where we think the protons, neutrons, and electrons actually exist in the atom. So that's what's coming up next. See you guys tomorrow.